years ago, I set out on a walking tour, high in the Alps, a region quite unknown to travelers, where ancient mountains thrust down into folds. The trek began on barren moors, 12 or 1,300 meters above sea level, through land that was bleak and monotonous. Nothing grew there but wild lavender. My route led across the region at its widest point, and after hiking for three days, I found myself in a wasteland, desolate, beyond description. I made camp near the remains of an abandoned village. The day before, my water supply had run out and I had to find some. The cluster of houses, although they were in ruins, reminding me of an old wasp's nest, made me think that once there must have been a fountain. Or perhaps a well. There was indeed a fountain, but it was dry. The roofless houses eaten away by wind and rain, and the chapel with its crumbling belfry stood arranged like houses and churches in a living village. But here, life had vanished. It was a sunny, cloudless June day, but over these bare highlands blew a fierce, insufferable wind. Growling through the skeletons of the houses, it sounded like a wild beast disturbed while feeding on its prey. I had to move camp. still had found no water, and I could see nothing that gave me hope of finding any. Everywhere, I came upon the same drought, the same coarse weeds. In the distance, something caught my eye. A thin, dark shape that I took for a tree stump. But just in case, I walked towards it. It was a shepherd. And beside him, resting on the burning ground, lay about 30 sheep. He let me drink from his gourd. And presently, he led me to his sheepfold in a hollow in the plain. He drew water, excellent water it was too, from a very deep natural well over which he had rigged a simple windlass. The man spoke very little, often the way with people who live alone, but he appeared sure of himself and confident in his assurance. It all seemed somehow strange in this barren land. He lived not in a hut, but in a real house, a stone house, whose walls clearly showed how his own labor had repaired the ruin it had once been. Its roof was solid and strong, and the wind on its tiles sounded like the sea upon the seashore. Inside, it was neat and tidy, dishes washed, floor swept, shotgun oiled, his soup simmered over the fire. And I noticed that he was freshly shaved, that all his buttons were firmly sewed on, and that his clothes were darned with that meticulous care which makes the mend invisible. He shared his soup with me. him my tobacco pouch. 
He told me he did not smoke. The dog, silent like his master, was friendly without fawning. It had been agreed that I would spend the night. The nearest village was still almost two days' walk away. Villages in this region were few and far between, and I knew well what they were like. Four or five of them were scattered over the slopes of these highlands, each one at the very end of a cart track among copses of white oaks. They were inhabited by charcoal burners. The living was poor, and families huddled together in a climate very harsh both in summer and winter found their struggle for survival made more bitter by their isolation. There was no relief. Their constant longing to escape became a crazy ambition. Endlessly, the men carted their charcoal to town, then returned home. Even the most stable characters crack under the constant grind. The women seethed with resentment there was rivalry in everything. The sale of charcoal and the church pew. They were rivals in virtue and rivals in vice. And the battle royal between vice and virtue raged incessantly. And always, there was the wind. The ever-present wind constantly grating on the nerves. There were epidemics of suicide and many cases of madness, nearly always ending in murder. The shepherd, who did not smoke, went to fetch a little sack, and onto the table he emptied a pile of acorns. He began to examine them very carefully, one by one, separating the good from the bad. I sat, smoking my pipe. I offered to help, but he told me it was his work, and indeed, seeing how very carefully he carried out his task, I did not insist was the only time we spoke. When he had set aside enough acorns, he divided them into piles of ten. As he did this, he discarded the smaller ones, or those that were cracked. For now, he was examining them very, very closely. When finally there lay before him a hundred perfect acorns, he stopped. And we went to our beds. Being with this man brought a great sense of peace. The following morning, I asked him if I might stay on and rest for the day. He found that quite natural, or to be more precise, he gave me the impression that nothing could upset him. The day of rest was not absolutely necessary, but I was intrigued, and I wanted to learn more about him. He let his sheep out of the pen and led them to their grazing. Before he went, he took the little bag of carefully chosen acorns and put them into a pail of water to soak. I noticed that for a walking staff, he carried an iron rod as thick as my thumb and about as high as my shoulder. Pretending to take a leisurely stroll, I followed him at a distance, but keeping on a parallel path with him. The pasture for his sheep was down in a dell. Leaving his dog in charge of the little flock, he began to climb towards me where I was standing. I feared he was coming to reproach me. Not at all. It happened to be on his way, and he invited me to go with him if I had nothing better to do. He was going a little farther on, to the top of the hill. When we reached his destination, he began to drive his iron staff into the ground. He made a hole, dropped in an acorn, and filled in the hole. He was planting oak trees. 
I asked him if he owned the land. He said no. Did he know who owned it? He did not. He thought it was common land, parish property, or perhaps it belonged to uh, people who did not care about it. That did not concern him. And so with infinite care, he planted his hundred acorns. After the midday meal, he began to sort out more of his acorns. I suppose I must have been quite insistent with my questions, because he answered me. For three years, he had been planting trees in that desolate country. He had planted 100,000. Of the 100,000, 20,000 had come up. Of these, he still expected to lose half, either to rodents or to any of the unpredictable things which only Providence can account for. That left 10,000 oaks to grow on this tract of land where before there was nothing. It was then that I wondered about the man's age. He was clearly more than 50. 55, he told me. His name was Elzéar Bouffier. He had owned a farm down in the lowlands. It had been his life. He had lost his only son, and then his wife, and had withdrawn into this solitude where he was content to live quietly with his lambs and his dogs was his opinion that the land was dying for lack of trees. He added that having nothing very important to do himself, he had resolved to remedy the state of affairs. I was young and only thought of the future as it affected me and my search for happiness. So I told him that in 30 years, those 10,000 oaks would be magnificent. He answered quite simply that if God granted him life, in 30 years, he would have planted so many more that these 10,000 would be like a drop of water in the sea. Already he was studying the growth of beech trees and had a nursery full of seedlings grown from beech nuts. They are quite beautiful. He was also thinking of birches for the dales where he told me there was moisture just below the surface of the soil. The next day, we parted. The following year came the First World War, in which I was engaged for five years. An infantryman was hardly likely to have trees on his mind. After demobilization, I found myself the possessor of a small gratuity and a great desire to breathe pure air. This was my only thought when I set off once more on the road to the barren land. The country had not changed. However, in the distance, beyond the deserted village, I noticed a sort of grayish mist that lay on the hilltops like a carpet. The shepherd who planted trees had been in my mind since the day before. 10,000 oak trees, I thought to myself, really need a lot of space. 